Hi everybody, welcome to the Coleco Atom for Dummies. This is a series of videos I'm going to make where I take the time to explain various aspects of the Coleco Atom, hardware, software, peripherals, how they work, in a very toned down, as little as possible, as little techno babble as possible, so that anybody can get it. It's not an aspiration on anybody, an aspersion, I'm sorry, it's not an aspersion on anybody by saying it's the Coleco Atom for dummies. It's more of a play on the dummies manuals that exist out there. So, I hope you enjoy this video. So, what we have here is a Coleco Atom datum drive. It's the second, second version of it. The first version is more like the ones that have been rebuilding. This is the second version. He sent it to me. The owner says that he got it a while back, but it's not working anymore. And he's considering buying a data drive from me, but he wants to know about this one. I said, well, send it. Let me look at it and see what's wrong with it. Normally, the first thing I do, well, first thing I always do is I always look them over before I plug them in to test them. So this one, when I opened up the box, I looked it over. Everything seems to be good. It does have a broken door here, but that's not the end of the world. So I open this up here and just take a look in here. And I'm going to pull the cover off, or the door off, just so you can see. Oh, my. Oh, somebody had to repair the door, so the door's been broken at one time, too. So this one's been through the ringer. Let's see if I can get it off. I didn't see that pin there. I can place that for him. But when I looked in there, I noticed one thing. And if you look at the data drive head, you may or may not be able to see that. See how dirty and rusty that is? So, I don't know if that happened after it got put away because it wasn't working, or if he got it and had that, and that's why it didn't work. But before I even, even attempt to test it, that's got to be clean. And then when I do this, it seems like it doesn't make much noise, so I might leave that alone for right now. I was going to go in here and, well, you can hear it there. It may, it may need cleaning, but that definitely needs to be scrubbed before we even try to test it. To scrub this thing, I'm going to, I'm going to put the Q-tip through the ringer here and try and make it work. My big bottle of rubbing alcohol is all gone. I used it up cleaning cartridges, cleaning the labels off of 40-some cartridges, so I went through all my rubbing alcohol. You know, after a while, you get a bad headache from smelling that. So I'm going to use a little bottle today. Let's get in here so we can find, uh, see what we can clean. Let's see how much this comes off gently cleaning here. But I think I may have to scrub, we'll see. Look at that. That is a mess and a half. It looks like rust, but I think actually more it might just be tape residue that's stuck on there. Yeah, it's cleaning up pretty good, so he might get lucky. It could just be bad, could just be residue from a bad tape. It might have sat in the dry for a while. And because of that, it just built up on it. Or I may have been using the same bad tape over and over again, but it, ooh, that thing's cleaning up pretty nice. Look at that. So, what, like I'm using this isopropyl alcohol and a Q-tip. You don't have to pull the door off to clean this. I like doing it if I can because it makes it a lot easier to get to. And you can really scrub. Sometimes, sometimes what you have to do is you have to actually take your fingernail and just get on there and just scrub to get the grime off because it's got stuff built up on it. You don't want to get busy on this with anything really abrasive. The most abrasive thing I ever used is I took a bandana, which is basically cotton, 100% cotton. And I wet it with alcohol and I just scrubbed and scrubbed until I got it nice and clean. But that looks clean now. That may or may not need oil. But I'm going to, since I cleaned up pretty well and this isn't making much noise, I'm going to give it a shot and test it real fast and see what it does. If it works, then great. If not, then we're going to pull apart and see what's inside of it. So, let's switch cameras around a little bit so you can see what I'm doing. Alright, so now I've got the second camera hooked up so that you can see the desktop here. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to hook this up to my Atom here, my, my system I have on the bench. When you hook them up, there's two different connectors. One has nine pins, one has eight pins. The nine pin connector goes in the back. 
So the one that says 1A. And this is in my way a little bit, so let's just move you over there. And plug that one into 1A. That one goes in pretty easy. Now the 8-pin goes into the one called 1B. And when you put these in here, so you don't get confused, if the little metal tabs right there, they face you. You see the metal tabs. So this goes into 1B. And just make sure that you actually get it on all 8 pins, that you don't get 7 and it's hanging off on 1. Now that has been plugged in. Let's turn my monitor on, on my TV. Where is the power? Power down here? You are plugged in, aren't you? Oh, power's up on top. Okay. Turn that on there. And reach back here and turn on my power to my atom. I'm blindly flopping around inside of the ColecoVision controller power explainer. Now, the first test I'm going to do is I'm going to use the Smart Writer test. I'm going to, when Smart Writer boots up, I'm going to go Escape, Get, Get, and it doesn't show anything there, but let's see if I press the button in on top, does it see the deck? It sees drive A, so electronically, it's alive. We know it's there. The next thing we're going to do is, again, staying within Smart Writer, I'm going to just stick a data pack in, a blank one. Stay with the smart writer. I'm going to see if I can read a directory from this. She makes some noise, so it sounds like the encoder needs to be cleaned. She reads a directory. It's, it's an empty deck, so there's nothing on it. So now we know that, okay, electronically it's good, and it read a directory. I'm going to, now this is a cartridge I made, it's the tape utility that ColecoVision used in-house to, let's get this in the right spot, to test their data drives. I, fl I switched these around, that's why it's not connected together. I use them for multiple purposes. Let's boot that up there. The Tape Utility Revision 22, copyright Coleco. Now when it comes up, what I'm going to do is I'm going to use this utility because I want to be able to, I want to verify I can read and write from the first track, which is track zero through, or block zero through 127, and read from the second track, the one in the back, which is blocks 128 through 255. If I can read and write and verify those two tracks, then the drive is good. It may overheat or run. If you run it for hours, it may stop working, but it's good at that point. So, we want to, my source is going to be tape one, my destination is going to be tape one, because this is, you can use this for duplicating. So, my source and destination are always tape, are tape one. I want to duplicate program, even though I'm not going to. Yes, I know, you can mess my data pack up, I understand that. Now, I want to know what block I want to do. I want to do block zero. What block do I want to end on? Block zero. So, now this is going to scroll and find block zero, read it, then write back to block zero, and then verify. So now once you put it, you want, because it thinks I'm duplicating, once you put the other tape in, I'm keeping the same one in. It got this far, so it read a clean block. It seeked, found block zero, read it. Now it's gonna write it. And then after it writes it, it will verify. Now it's going back to verify, it's reading it. It's gonna verify that what it wrote is actually what it read. And if that's True, completed. Now we'll make a lot of noise here and try to press the key. So, track, the front track, blocks 0 through 127. It's reading that, no problem, the front track. Now we're going to do the back track. Again, same thing. This time for my block, I'm going to give it block A0, which is about center of the back track, so it doesn't have to go crazy trying to find it. If you want to convert that over, A0 works out to be, I believe it's block 160, or thereabouts. I believe that's what it is, 160. So it's going to read, it found block A0 already. Now it wants me to switch the tape in, which I'm not going to do. Now it's going to write it. And then it will go seek it again. It's going to read it. It's going to compare the two in memory, and if they're the same, then it was a good read, write, Work good. I would do some extensive testing on this afterwards, but now we know this this tape deck or this data pack drive is good. 
So I'm going to unhook this, turn it off, unhook it, take it apart, and we're going to oil up that encoder so it doesn't make any more noise, and we're going to clean it all up, make it look pretty. All right, so now to pull this apart, what I need to do is, since this is a, secondary, a second model of it, it's different than the first model. The first model it has, I'll show you. Let's just give you a comparison here. This is the first version of the data drives. This is the one i got to work on. There's a difference in them, as you can see. The difference is down in here in the hinge. These hinge pins are screwed on. These are molded into the case, which means if these break, I just un I remove the hinge, put a new one on. If these break, you got to do something like this, like somebody did for it. The other nice thing about this second version is that you can actually see the bottom of the encoder here, and anything that falls inside the encoder can get out. This one, it can't. It gets stuck in there. The other thing about this is the first version, the door latch is screwed on. The second version is clipped on. Another thing that's different is in the first versions, the cables are stuck in with a nice strain relief. The second version, they're just held on with a zip tie. Now when we get inside, this is my note telling me what's wrong with this one. So far I know that the door is bad and it's got bad motors. Now when we go to get inside of here, you'll see there are some other changes, differences too. If you've seen any of the other drives I've worked on, or if you've ever opened up a data drive before. I've got to cut that off, take out the four screws. This comes apart the same no matter what version you have. Take these four screws out. Come on. Sometimes they come out easy, sometimes they don't. Let's get them out of there. One, two. There we go. Get all the four screws over to the side. Then we take and we snake these cables out the hole on the back. Again, both versions are like this. Now the thing that's different now is that in this newer version, the RF shield is mounted inside the case here. In the older version, the RF shield is loose in here and held in with screws. It has screws on both sides that holds everything down. This one doesn't have any screws holding anything in place. It just uses the case and the RF shield is loose in here. Now the nice thing about this, this style drive is everything is held together with connectors. Where the other style of drive, it may be connectors, it may be solder, it's probably going to have a lot of hot glue. So to get down, what we're doing is we're going to get down to the encoder wheel because we're going to oil it up. So what we do is we lift these out gently, don't pull. Watch what you're doing, watch the wires, keep an eye on everything you're doing so that you can get this out and around the RF shield so the RF shield comes out. See that? Here's your motors. Which is fascinating. I have never noticed that, that a bigger motor and a smaller motor. I've never seen the difference in them. Maybe Coleco just got a different version that day. There's your RF shield. Another difference on these different models is that on the older version, the tape sensor is mounted inside the case here. On the newer version, it's mounted on the PCB board. I don't know if that was a cost reduction or what. Now where we're going is, we're going in here. This is the encoder. It's held in with two screws. No matter what version you have, it's two screws. You can't swap the parts from this one with the older version or vice versa. There is a slight difference in the shape inside. Trying to swap them is not very easy to do. I needed a container to hold some screws in because I don't want things flopping around here because we're going to have some loose parts soon. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to remove these two screws here to hold the encoder in place. I'm going to pause as I'm going along just to watch the screen to make sure that I am not going off camera because I have done that in the past. So those two are out of the way. Now we're going to lift this out gently. If you have a melted encoder wheel where all the rubber is melted in there, this is not coming out very easily. You're going to be very careful and have to gently move it out. But what I'm going to do is I'm slowly pulling it out make sure it's not catching. I lift that up there. I'm watching for washers just in case the washer comes loose. Set that to the side. Now I'm going to take tweezers, I'm going to take this axle right here. Now, 
I guess I could technically try to oil it here, but I can't get to that front bearing. So what I'm going to do is take this axle here, pull that out, set it to the side. This right here is the sensor. Sometimes they are held in with double-sided tape, sometimes they're loose. This one is double-sided tape, but it's not stuck on too tight. So just pull that out and hold off to the side. You see that little washer there? We don't want to lose that. Keep an eye on it. This is a diffraction grating that is used with the wheel. See the, how you can see through that and you can see through the wheel. As it spins, the light goes through like a polarized lens. It goes on and off, on and off, and that strobing tells the data drive mechanism here how fast the drive is actually moving. I, we call it an encoder. Some people call it an indexing. I don't know if it does anything with the actual signal, if it just is a pulse telling this thing how fast the drive is going. Now to get that little washer there, there's a little trick. Take your finger, touch it to your tongue to wet it, tap it, got the washer. <laughs> it's as simple as that. Now to get this out, don't squeeze the wheel. Don't break or the diffraction cream. Don't break it. Be very careful picking it up. If you can't get to it that way, try to get it this way. But you don't want to squeeze it between your fingers. See? We don't want to damage that. If you're taking this apart to replace the encoder wheel, there's probably going to be melted rubber all over this. If you can get this out without destroying it, you can get that melted rubber off. Let it soak in rubbing alcohol for an hour or two, then gently wipe it out straight out across the, along with the degrading. Don't go sideways like this. If you can't get off, you can sometimes take your fingernail and gently pull it this way. Try not to break that grating, because you break that grating, you break the wheel and it's useless. And they don't have replacements for it. Then if you need to replace this part here, you can use half inch outside diameter, 5 sixteenths I believe it is, is it 5 sixteenths? Uh, no, uh, 3 eighths. Half inch outside diameter, 3 eighths inside diameter, or not 3 eighths, what's the next one? Um, 7 sixteenths, 7 sixteenths inside diameter. Nylon, tubing, slides on here, you can get it from Lowe's, works very good. Now we should have one more washer, which is right here. And you could probably hear, I have a rainstorm coming. Good thing I did not ride my bicycle to work today. So that, that's the encoder mechanism. Very simple. There's no bearings in there. This, this little metal axle sits in that plastic hole and in that plastic hole in the washers. So it's just metal and plastic. It makes noise. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to oil it. And I'm not just going to squirt oil down in there because I don't want to make a mess. I don't want to get everywhere. What I'm going to do is this is sewing machine oil. I'm going to put just a drop of that on this piece of wax paper here so I have some to work with. Get up there. Yeah, just like that. Just a drop of it on the wax paper. Get that away. Set it off to the side out of my way. And then I'm going to take my axle. Make sure I don't lose my pieces. Get in there and stay. Take my little axle. I'm going to hold it with my tweezers as such. I'm dipping it in the oil just to get that end nice and wet. Stand it back up. Take that axle. I'm going to put it down in that hole there. And push it down with my finger so it's in. Now I'm going to take my finger, I'm going to wet it with my tongue, get one of these washers to stick to it. I'm going to take it and I'm going to lay it on there so that the washer goes up. Try it again. Lay it on the axle so that the washer goes on the axle, I said. That's such. See, it's on the axle. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to take a little screwdriver I have right here, a little screwdriver. Dip in my oil, just to get some more oil on here. I'm going to take this end, the wheel end right there. I'm just going to take and I'm going to leave this to just drop some oil down in that hole there a little bit. Maybe a little bit more than that. Again, you don't want to over wet this because it will make a mess and I don't, it may actually mess up the grating if it gets on it. So I put some oil down there, just enough. I'm going to take this, I'm going to hold this like so. I'm gonna, and I'm not squeezing, I'm just holding it. I'm gonna line this up so that it falls down on the hole like that. Now, the next washer. When you take this apart, there may be two washers, or maybe three washers, or maybe one washer. 
Normally you only need one on each side. If you ever notice that the for one reason the encoder wheel is not turning too well, take one of those washers out. Now that's what I've done in the past. Now with the last washer, wet my finger again. Come in here. I'm going at an angle so I can see the little hole, so I can see that the hole is lining up in it. Take my screwdriver again, get a nice little blob of oil on it, and just set it down on top of that washer, just like that. Now the next thing I'm going to do is I'm going to take this piece right here, and this is harder to pick up sometime, and lay this on there. It goes on one way. Normally this is a circle on one side and an oval on the other. The oval goes towards the motors. It can go the other way, it doesn't matter, but that's normally the way when you take them apart you find the circle on this side, oval on the other. Now that I got that, I'm going to take the encoder. I'm sorry, the, the sensor, slide it underneath everything till I get it in there. There's a little, little place where the set's inside there. Like a little, it's got like a little shelf that it sits in. Now this one, the glue isn't too sticky, so it may not stick to it. They got a little piece of rubber here to hold it in place. So I set it in there. Now I'm going to take this, and if you set this down directly, straight down on it, you will line up the hole. Like that. Move that, hold that in there. Let's just make sure my sensor's in good. I'm in there good. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to hold it in with my finger. So it don't go nowhere. Pop that door open. I want to move the wheel. Make sure the wheel's not bound up. All good so far. Take my screws. Put them back in the same holes. One nit. Try this again. Put it back in the same hole. One over here. I'm just snugging them down. You don't want to super tighten this thing. Come here. You got a little bit of magnetism on that screwdriver. This one over here. Okay, now I'm going to check again. I just want to make sure I didn't... What I'm doing is I'm reaching in here and I'm turning that. And now I'm going to just make sure that my sensor's not moving. Everything's good so far. We take my RF shield. Now since this is the, the newer model, the shield goes in easier. On the older models, you got to struggle and fight to get the shield to go in and the wires to go in, but you can do it. You just take your time. It's not a struggle as much as you just got to take your time. So we put that in there. We put this in. It can only go in one way because the wires that plug into the atom, the cables have to be facing out. The wires are caught up around the shield. I got to see right here. I got to make sure they're not caught up between the shield and the case. Come on, this one, one lousy wire. There we go. Wires in there. You up here. There. Now that's in there. I'm going to verify again. See that one wire keeps wanting to come over there, so I want, I want you behind everything. Thank you. That right there. The next thing we're going to do is we're going to take and slide these through our slots that they came out of. Now, if you were doing an earlier model, you would set the other RF shield on here. Then you'd screw down the screws to hold it all into place. This later model doesn't have that, so you don't have to worry about that. So that makes it a little easier to assemble. I don't know if one's better than the other. Some people say these are better. It does. It is easier if you were trying to adjust the speed on them, but for all honesty sakes, I've never adjusted the speed to it on a data drive. There's a little adjustment right there. You got to boot up the data drive with the speed adjuster thing and then adjust it. So if you're booting it up already, it's like, well, okay, now that it works, maybe I should make it work. So what I've done now is I'm going to screw all these pieces back on there, or all these screws back on here, hold it in place. And now I'm going to turn this camera off and we're going to go back onto the other camera and we're going to see how it sounds and we're going to do a more thorough test. Alright, so now what I've done is I plugged the data drive back in. And I've got 
the Atom hooked up to my disk emulator over here on off screen. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to load up File Manager. I'm going to use File Manager to format and verify this data pack. Let's just put the data pack in here. I'm going to go to Media Functions, Format Media. I'm going to switch to make sure it's on Tape Drive 1. And I'm going to hit Return to Start. And I guess I didn't get it seated in there all the way. Let's try that again. There it goes. Now, do you notice the sound difference after after oiling the index wheel? See how much quieter it is? It'll stay like that for a while, but eventually. I'm moving around a little bit. I'm sorry. While it's doing this, I'm going to clean off the oil that's on my counter here so I don't get anything else. Some of the oil dripped off of the thing when I was moving stuff around. It'll stay like this, nice and quiet, for maybe a month or two, maybe longer. And eventually, you start making noise again, then you got to oil it again. Now, what this is doing is File Manager is looking at the data pack and it's finding each block, block 0 through 255. When it finds that block, it writes in a null string. I think it uses um, E5 hex is what it fills it with. Then when it's done doing all of them, it'll then ask me if I want to verify, which means, well, not ask me, it's going to, because I told it to. It'll go back and it'll read every one of those blocks to make sure that what it wrote there is what's still on there. So this is verifying multiple things. First off, it's verifying that it can find the index number for every block. So that means it's reading front track and back track. Then if it can't if it can't read that, if you have problems where it's reading and all of a sudden it just keeps breaking on one block, can't find one block, can't find one block, there's a good chance it's your data drive is bad. Now what it just did is it reached the end of the tape. Now it's got to seek block 64, which means it's got to rewind all the way back to the beginning, because this one is a tape that has a directory in the center. So the first Half of the tape is blocks 64 through 127. The second half of the tape is blocks 0 through 160 or through 63. Then on the back, the first half is 128 through. That's just 128 all the way to 255. What that means is that the directory is always in the middle of the tape, so it's always you're never more than half a tape away from the directory. If the directory is at the beginning of the tape and you were at the end, well then you are a whole tape away from it. So what it did is it got to the end of the tape and it rewound back looking for block 64, which is at the beginning, which it found. As you can see, it's counting down that it's finding these blocks. And as it finds these blocks, it fills in the block with the, the null information, the E5. Once it gets up to block 127, it will rewind back all the way back again to the beginning and it will do the back side of the tape. So by doing this, we're verifying multiple things. We're verifying one that it can read from the front track and the back track. Two, that it can seek and find the individual blocks. It can determine that it's at the end and beginning of a tape. And then when it goes to verify, it's going to verify that what it's writing on tape is what it reads off a tape. So once you format a tape deck or a data pack with File Manager, you're pretty much kind of guaranteeing that it's working. As long as you're working with a good data pack to start with, this is going to give you a good idea that your data drive is fine. If you, keep it, if you keep having errors, the biggest error, you know, if it has problems finding a block, that could be the data pack. If it has trouble finding a block starting at like block 128 on, it could, it could be that one track, the back track is bad. So now it's going to go find the black track, it's going to be wind. If you start getting CRC errors, especially, I, I usually get CRC errors on the back track. You start getting CRC errors. That means that it's not reading correctly, that it's not, at that point, if you get a CRC error, because it comes up and tells you you want to ignore it, but you can ignore it. And if you keep getting a CRC error over and over again, one block after another, your system is not writing correctly. The data drive is not writing to tape correctly. What it's reading off is garbled. And sometimes that ruins the data pack because not only is it garbled, it overwrote the indexing too. So that's garbled, so you can't even reformat it. What I do is, because I have the bulk copier that I can copy on, I can do three types or three data packs at a time. 
I take these data packs as I'm using them. After I'm done using them, I take, uh, after I'm done doing the destructive where I've changed things around enough, I take in a bulk erase, bulk copy again, a blank data pack, format on them. So then I always start with a fresh format instead of using a data pack that's bad. If I get a data pack that squeals, and it consistently squeals, I get rid of it. If I get a data pack that consistently is in CRC error or other error like, and I format it and it still gives it to me, I get rid of it. I don't mess with bad data packs because I have had too many times where I thought my drive was bad and it was just a bad $1 tape that I converted to a data pack. These are a little bit more than a dollar, but yes. I've had issues with that. Basically, you pull your hair out doing it. See, now it's almost there. It's got to get to block 255. When it gets to block 255, then it's done formatting. Then it's going to run through an initialize or verify, which means it's going to read the whole thing again. I'm going to let this thing happen, and I will fast forward through it. And at the if we get an issue, I won't. I'll stop the fast forwarding. Otherwise, I'll let it go all the way to the end without talking. Alright, so now it has less than 20 bucks to go. Once it gets to the end, and as you notice, it never had a hiccup. It never, the screen never changed, it never paused, it never rewound and went back trying to find a block. Cleanly, this drive is very nice. It's going through very clean. Once it gets to block 255, it's going to rewind back to block 0 so that it can initialize it, which means set up the directory. Listen how quiet this drive is. A little bit of oil made that much of a difference. Remember how it squealed when I first got it, when I first tested it, when I was checking the directory with SmartWriter. It squealed. So now it's going to initialize the media. In any second, she'll be done. And she's done. And just to verify, I'm going to come back out here, and I'm just going to read the directory. I pressed one for file functions. And there shouldn't be anything on here, it should just say first directory. So it's an empty thing. And now just, uh, well, I'm just curious what it is. I'm going to go into media functions. I'm going to go into edit block. And I'm just going to pick, uh, I don't care what block number, I'll pick um, block zero because that's the first one. Um, two, uh, no, not that, not that, not that, thank you. This one, block zero. I'm curious to find out what does it actually write in there. Was it E5 that it's filling it in with? Let's just see. It's reading block zero off the tape. Oh, okay, so it puts some of this in here, initializing media. That's kind of fascinating. Let's see. Did it, block, did it initialize it with all zeros? I mean, that's fine, too. E5 is used because it's one bit on, one bit off, on, off, on, off. So it gives you an idea if there's something wrong. I guess all zeros would do, it too. Let's just pick a block further. I'm going to block 32. Let's just see what comes up in block 32. Just forget some shiggles. If you don't know what gets and shiggles is, I'm not going to tell you that it means S H I T E S and giggles. You have to figure that one out. It is E5, so it fills it in with E5. So that would let it. If it doesn't, if it reads back and it's not E5, then it can pick up on the fact that one bit was bad. Though I guess if you filled it in with zeros, well, no, because if you filled it in with zeros and you got nothing back, it could still be zero. So this helps. So there we go. We have. Just taking a few moments, I'm going to turn this off back here. I should make this power switch more visible so I don't hurt myself. We are, and I'll hook this tape deck here. That was right here. Just in a few minutes, I've taken, scrubbed that head down, which was severely dirty, pulled it completely apart, and oiled up the encoder, and verified that she works. And I'm going to send it back to the owner. I'm going to send him a message here. I'm going to say, I got some good news and I got some bad news. 
The good news is I was able to clean your tape head, your data drive head, and oil your encoder, and it works great. Reads, writes, everything works perfect. The bad news is you don't need to buy a data drive from me. So there we go. Have a good day.